Welcome to our second video on sizing steel wide flange beams from tables. This is section 6.3.3. 6.3 is steel beams, point three is wide flanges. This is the second video which we're designating as video B. And in this video we're going to be working on sizing for stiffness. So I'll remind you that we said for steel we usually don't design for shear or we don't focus on it because steel is so strong in shear that that's rarely the controlling issue. Um, <clears throat> we're going to focus on moment capacity and stiffness and we're going to start with stiffness because as we indicated for certain reasons that makes the sizing procedure simpler and we have to deal with both of them one way or the other. So that's how we're going to start. So, um, we had a formula that the maximum deflection for a simple span beam is 5W L to the fourth over 384 EI, where L is the length of the beam. This is a very sensitive dependence, by the way, L to the fourth. Uh, you don't have to increase the length of a beam by, by very much to have really drastic effects on delta. So we really have to look at this carefully. The E is the material stiffness uh, in kips per square inch. And I is the moment of inertia of the cross-section, or what we're calling the cross-sectional stiffness, which is in units of inches to the fourth. In this sizing procedure, we're only going to look at W live. Uh, and the reason for that is that our primary concern here is people's perception of movement. So people won't notice the movement in the building as dead load is added. Uh, it will cause a, a visible deflection in the beam if you stare down along the length of the beam, but otherwise you would never be able to detect it. And you certainly don't detect its effect when you're just standing on the floor, but you do detect movement to um, shifting live load. So for example, I lived in a house with some fairly shallow wood floor beams and when my 10 year old son would come bounding through the living room it felt like the end of the world was coming. Um, in general you don't want floors that move too much. Uh, people perceive that there's a one-to-one -one correlation between uh, a rubbery floor and a weak floor so they don't like movement and even people who understand that it's not a safety issue are distracted by the movement of the floor. Now we want to think like designers so we are going to set a limit on delta max and that in turn we're going to have to satisfy in some way and we we're going to have a certain live load which is set by code we're going to have a certain span which is determined by the whole thought process about how the building gets laid out uh, we will choose a material which typically carries with it a certain uh, material stiffness. So as designers, the thing that we control is this cross-sectional property called the cross-sectional stiffness or the moment of inertia. So what we can do actually is we can rewrite this equation where we interchange delta max and I. So we end up with a, an I required, a cross-sectional required stiffness which is 5W live times L to the fourth over 384E divided by delta max. Now delta max is almost always prescribed as a certain fraction of the length. So we talk about a deflection that's L over 360. So what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these L to the fourth and we're going to isolate it off with delta max. So we're going to leave L cubed here with all those other terms and separate out 1L and we're taking the ratio of L over delta max. So if delta max is L over 360 then L over delta max is 360 so we're going to replace whatever's in this bracket here with the number 360. This number by the way can change in some roofing conditions we only require uh, a, a 240 here um, on certain types of spandrel beams that support a lot of glass or brick, we may have a deflection criterion of L over 600. 
Um, so you have to look at the situation and figure it out. But to first order, to our first calculation for stiffness of floors, for example, will be L over delta equal to 360. So that's what this formula looks like. Now I'm going to issue the warning again, and this you will really see the effects of it in this example. Excel will not get your units correct for you, so you don't want to just start typing a formula in to the computer because you have to work out the units first and incorporate the appropriate conversions in the equation that you input to Excel. So if we take this equation right here, 5WL cubed over 384E times 360 and do it in units, uh, W live is in kips per foot, length is in feet, so feet cubed is feet times feet times feet, and then E is in kips per square inch, so I'll write that down here. Now we have this square inch down in the denominator of the denominator, which we clearly don't want. So first thing we're going to do is clean that up by multiplying inch squared times this denominator to cancel out that. But I can't multiply the overall denominator by inches squared unless I multiply the overall numerator by inches squared. So I'm multiplying in the square brackets by inches squared per inches squared then this inch squared and that inch squared will cancel out. Uh, one of these feet will cancel out with one of those feet. So I'm left with feet squared above, and, and then that's times inches squared. So we got feet squared times inches squared, and we want to get any cross-sectional property. We're interested in cross-sectional stiffness I. So we want to get any cross-sectional property in, all in inches. So we don't want inches squared times feet squared. We want to get rid of the feet squared units. And the way we're going to do it is we're going to multiply by 12 inches per foot. So this foot cancels out that one. And another 12 inches per foot, which cancels out that one. And then we're left in inches squared times inch times inch, which is inches to the fourth. Now, the really crucial thing to notice here is we've introduced two numbers here, 12 and 12, that we would not have intuitively known were there if we hadn't tracked and properly converted the units. So these 12s have to go into the formula that we introduce into our Excel spreadsheet. So we're going to pull that spreadsheet up and we're going to go up to the top again and we're going to look at sizing for stiffness and unfortunately I'm sort of losing it off the top of the page here, but I think I'll keep it at this magnification so uh, we can see the lettering properly. So in this, between these two bold uh, lines or, or border elements, we have this category called sizing for stiffness, which we look for a required cross-sectional stiffness or moment of inertia, which is 5W live times L cubed over 360 times 360 over 284E. And we're going to find out what's required. And so when we go down and look at this formula, let's look at this carefully. We've got the 5 times G28, which is W live. So um, that is right here. W live is 0.1 in this case. So Excel goes and grabs the content of this cell and inserts it into the formula. So we're designating it as G28, but when the computations are done, it goes in as 0.1 kips per foot, these units right here. Now you'll notice there's a B28 to the third power. So we come here and we say, well, where is B28? And that's right here, so that's the length of the joist. So that makes sense because we have an L cubed. Then we have a 360, and then we have this 144, which is 12, 12 times 12. That was the conversion units that we introduced. So if you had just started writing this equation and not worked out the units, you'd be off by a factor of 144 here. Uh, and you'd be undersized by that much. So that's not a good thing. 
Then we're dividing by 384 times the material stiffness E of steel, which is 29,000 kips per square inch. So when we run all those numbers, we get 62.8 inches to the fourth. Now we have to go look in some tables somewhere and find something that has that moment of inertia. So we're going to go look at some tables like that. And they look like this. You'll notice this is IX, and we don't have a diagram of it, but IX is the moment of inertia about the strong axis. So it's the key moment of inertia that we need where the web of this beam is set vertical and the beam is resisting gravity forces. So you'll notice here there's a shape and then there's a column called IX and then there's some other columns which for the moment you can just ignore because we're focusing on getting this information right here. And the tables repeat. So here we've got a W36 by 798 which is 36 nominal 36 inches deep by 798 pounds per foot. Um, it has a moment of inertia of 62,600 inches to the fourth. When we finish out a column here, we jump over and we start the shapes again in another column of moments of inertia, and then another set of shapes and another set of moments of inertia. And You'll notice, by the way, that this table is divided up into clumps. There's a bunch of beams here, and at the top is a beam in bold. And the, what the, the meaning of this is, is this beam right here not only has a higher moment of inertia than anything below it, so right here it's 31,100, the next one's 31,000, the next one's 29,000, and so forth. Not only is that a higher moment of inertia, but it's also the lightest of everything in that group. So one of the nice things about this table is if you're giving an given an assignment to find the lightest beam satisfying a certain moment of inertia requirement, you only have to look at the bold numbers. Any of these others are automatically heavier and therefore you can ignore them. Okay, so this is the first table of IX values and uh, it starts at the really heavy end and by the time we get to the end of that page we're down to a W30 by 99 which is 30 inches deep and 99 pounds per foot. So now we're going to jump to the next page. It goes from the W30 by 90 the other one was by 99, and it goes all the way down to a W10 by 12, 10 inches deep and weighing 12 pounds per foot. So we're going to blow up this table of the second page. So here again, we're starting with a 30 by 90 and working our way down across the page. And the key data we're looking for is the shape and the moment of inertia and again, we're going to ignore these other two quantities for the moment because they're not that pertinent to what we're doing. So we're going to come back here and we see we're looking for a moment of inertia of 62.8 inches to the fourth. So we're going to go back to this table and we're going to see that all of these, this is on the second page, so these are all the lightweight ones and all of these are way bigger than 62.8. So we're going to go all the way down to the bottom here and we're going to see that the lightest one that works has a moment of inertia of 88.5 inches to the fourth and it's a W12 by 14. So now we're going to go back to our Excel spreadsheet and we put 88.6 inches to the fourth for a W12 by 14. And you'll notice I've put these the depth and the weight in separate columns because at various times we'll have a need to compute on one or the other of those numbers so we don't just write W12 by 14 all in one cell. So now if we come down here and we look at this formula we're looking at the same uh, 5 times W live. So here it is uh, G31 and here is 
um, the uh, G31, excuse me. Yes, I'm sorry, we're not looking at that. We, we are, we're wait, we're using, five, let's go to the formula, 5W live. So that's 5 times this, which is G31, times L cubed. So when we go down here, we have 5 times G1 times B31 to the third power. So here we have B31, which is the length of the girder, times 360 times our conversion factor of 144 divided by 384 times 29,000, which is kips per inch, square inch, which is the stiffness of steel. So we came out in this case with 188.5. So we're going to go back to our table. And let me read that again because I immediately forgot it. It's 188.5. So I'm scanning up here. And the lightest one that works is 197. And you'll notice I'm only looking at the dark or the bold print. And that's a W14 by 22. So 197 inches to the fourth is the cross-sectional stiffness for a W14 by 22. I'm going to go here and I write 197 for a W14 by 22. 197 inches to the fourth. So again, we do the same formula down here, except that now we're going to G34. So we're on line 34 times B34, which is the length of the girder cubed times 360 times our conversion factor and so forth. We get 377. So now we're going to go to our table and we're looking for 377. We're going to scroll up here and that doesn't quite work. See, we're so close, 375. And some people would say, well, it's stiffness, it's a perceptual issue, and you can legally go below this. I mean, it's a perceptual issue and what you're doing is running some risk that you're cutting it too close and your client will consider the floor too rubbery. But most engineers would consider this perfectly satisfactory and most architects would also but to be rigorous we're going to do our job here and we're going to find something that's greater than 377 now that's forcing us to jump all the way up here now this is really not too bad because we've only increased it by four pounds per linear foot from 31 to 35 it just feels really extravagant because we were only going for 377 and we had to jump all the way up to 510. But according to the rules of our game, that's what we're gonna do. It's 510 inches to the fourth for a W18 by 35. So we're gonna come back here and we'll write 510 for a W18 by 35. Now we can go down to the similar tables here and we're not gonna do all of these, but you can work through them because you'll have this image here uh, for the um, floor joist, we got a load of 53 pounds a square foot for the area distributed dead load, 100 pounds a square foot for the live load. So when we look at our formula here, it is now five times this load, G37, times B37 cubed, so that's the length of the floor joist. And then we have our 360 times our conversion factor of 144 and all the rest of that formula looks the same. We came out with a required moment of inertia of 314. And now when we come back here, um, we see this doesn't work, that one does. 375 is well above inches to the fourth for a W16 by 31. So now we go to our Excel spreadsheet and we have a W16 by 31 with a moment of inertia of 375 inches to the fourth, which is well above that. <coughs> In the case of our single loaded floor girder, the number gets even higher. We're looking for 942.7. And now when we come to this table, 
we see that we're somewhere over here. So, in fact, I think this would be the number 959 for a W21 by 48. So let's see if that's what we got. W21 by 46 uh, with a moment of inertia of 959. And when we finish this out, we're starting to get really big numbers. Well, relatively big numbers for the double loaded floor girder. We need 1885.3 inches to the fourth. And the beam that works is W24 by 76, which has a moment of inertia of 2100 inches to the fourth. Now, uh, this would be a good time to explain why we chose to size for stiffness before we sized for strength. In the case of strength, you have to know that the, the beam can, under full factored dead and live load, that the beam will safely handle the load. That means it also has to handle its own self-weight. And you don't know exactly how to start guessing the self-weight of the beam. Well, the beauty to this procedure of sizing for stiffness first is stiffness is not based on the total full factored load, it's based only on the live load. So in other words, once you've done the sizing for stiffness, it's a one step operation and it doesn't have to be repeated because the loads that are involved in that sizing operation don't change once the beam is sized. So it gives you not only a non-iterative first step, in the sizing process. It also gives you an estimate, a, a really good estimate of the self weight of the beam, which can then be used in the first step for sizing for strength. So that ends our video on sizing steel wide frame, wide flange beams from tables where we're focusing on sizing for stiffness.